Tom Moore, Sixers beat writer, Calkins Media, set to join us to give us a little perspective on how big of a night this is uh, for the franchise. I said this, and we started our show like this. You look at the playoffs. You watch that game last night. You watch two mediocre teams play in a game seven. A 49-win team played a 53-win team. The 53-win team won. And really, the only reason that anybody likes Boston moving forward is the same reason you like Philadelphia. They have ping-pong balls. You take the ping-pong balls out of it, Pete, you probably look at Boston as a team that, okay, it's a nice story. Where are they going? Washington, how are they going to get better? They got no pick in this year's draft. It's I feel bad for that team. They got a couple of nice pieces. But the reason you're excited tonight is because you've got an opportunity to to really land some top-end talent. Let's bring Tom Moore into the conversation here and uh, get some perspective from him on just how important this night is. Uh, We know it's been year after year after year, but this one feels a little different. This one feels like the Brian Colangelo word, jumping off point, Tom, of how important uh, their ping-pong ball bounces will be tonight. Yeah, to me, it's all about getting number one and Markel Fultz. Um, If they don't do that uh to me it gets real interesting because he is such a perfect fit and the only way maybe you could get him at number two would be if the lakers get number one um i I, you know it sounds like the lakers like him and he and his dad certainly like the lakers but to me it's all about number one I, i i wouldn't even care as much if you get number one it doesn't matter to me almost what happens in the next pick to me i'd almost rather uh the sixers not get the lakers pick and then have it unprotected next year if you get number one Um, because I could see in a scenario where that second pick, if they get it, Colangelo could trade it for a veteran or package something maybe to try, especially if you would get Fultz to try to sort of speed things up um, the process, you know, to get a a veteran, somebody who's been there, somebody who um, has some playoff experience and so on to kind of help maybe take them at least that first step of the way. So, Tom, if they don't get the number one overall pick, you think there's a possibility then that they would say two, three, there's, that there's, because a lot of people don't think there's a big drop off between one, two, three, four, even five in this draft. But you think if they don't get number one, that they would be willing to, to move that? Well, I mean, to me, there is a drop off from the Sixers standpoint because if you're going to play Simmons as the point guard on offense, you need somebody who can shoot, you need somebody. Um, who can play on the ball and off the ball. You need someone who's athletic, and there's really only one guy um, in this draft that you know, t- uh, checks all those boxes, and that's Fultz. There's a lot of other talented players, but uh, the Sixers would love to add shooting, but the, the best shooter in the draft, uh, Malik Monk, I- I'm not a huge fan of. Um, he's undersized, not a real good defender, a little bit of a streaky shooter. Um, everybody see, and I love Fox. I mean, I love everything he does. He's not a good shooter, which is the problem. But Fox is fast. He gets to the basket. He's left-handed. He's a really good defender. He's a high-character guy. But he shot, you know, 25% from three last year um, in his only year at Kentucky. So the problem to me is after Fultz, everybody sort of has a fall, a flaw, or a, you know, a, a fairly significant flaw in terms of what the Sixers want. So that's why, to me. He's such a per- and he's six four. He's got good size. Um, he's you know a terrific dunker. You know, really runs the court well with the up tempo style and all that stuff. So to me, that's it's all about that. Anything else would be very interesting, and I, I think would mean that Brian Colangelo has you know has really has work to do because you have to figure out who fits the best among the rest. Or as I said, possibly if it's a later pick, four or five or something, maybe think about trading it possibly. Um, to get somebody who can help right away and help speed this up. Tom, how buried are the Sixers to playing Ben Simmons at the point? I know at one point I threw out the name Kyle Lowry, and Gil shot me down immediately because said, oh, he plays the point. Ben Simmons is going to play the point. Are the Sixers locked into that Ben Simmons point guard idea? Well, Brett Brown wants to do that. That's his plan. The problem is, Pete, you know, he didn't get – that's why, to me, even if he played 10 games this year, I think that would have been really helpful because you could have seen what it looked like, how he – I mean, he's never really been a point guard. He's been a point forward. He's been a power forward before. But you could see how it would work out. Now you're basically – you're basing it on faith. You're hoping that it works because if he's not the point guard and you don't draft the true point guard, you know, then, um, you know, you're, you're kind of guessing and hoping here. That's why it makes it difficult. Um, Because you really don't know, and there's no way to know, and he's probably not playing in the summer league. 
So you're not going to know until training camp, you know, November of, of the regular season next year before it'll really work. And then, as I said, if it doesn't, do you have the right people? Which is why a guy like Bayless, um, is val- if he's healthy, is valuable because he can play the point, he can play off the ball, he's a good shooter. To me, uh, Fultz is a better, bigger uh, Bayless you will, you know, with a higher upside. Yeah, and to me, uh, you know, we're talking about Pete, and obviously the Lowry stuff has been out there, a lot of dots connecting there, but uh, Bayless almost, I mean, is a, I don't want to say, is a poor man's version of Lowry. Like, he's a veteran who can shoot. Uh, he kind of already, they already have that box checked, kind of. Um, You know, I, I, I think that, uh, I, yeah, I think Bayless is, I wouldn't be shocked if he's your starter if, if they, it doesn't work out right in the draft. But to me, again, if they finish fourth or fifth in the lot or something like that, I would think that would increase the chances that he would go after somebody like uh, Lowry, who's going to command probably $30 million a year, and who Colangelo traded for in Toronto, um, um, who is undersized, you know, like 5'11 or so, but is a scorer and an all-star. Um, I guess he could play off the ball. He wouldn't have the ball in his hands as much. But, like, if you get Fultz, you don't really need Lowry, per se, if you will, because it's too many. It would be three guys that want to have the ball in their hands, if, if you will. So that's why so much depends. When they go to commercial and they've turned over a number four, you'll know if they have the Lakers pick at least. And if they're if the Sixers card doesn't come, is, isn't up yet, you know the Sixers are in the top three. So, you know, when, when that happens – um, we'll at least have a pretty good idea of what's going on. Tom Moore with us. Yeah, they already had a situation where they had too many big guys. Let's not get in a situation where they have too many point guards. How about a guy, Tom, like uh, Dennis Smith Jr. from NC State? He was pretty, uh, from the three-point range, looked like a dynamic player. If the Sixers don't trade that pick and they're sitting three through six, what do you think of Dennis Smith Jr. at NC State as an option? Yeah, I, Peter, I'm not a, honestly, I'm not a huge fan. I, I I understand. I know he had some big games. I know Monk had some big games. They said it just seems like everybody um, other than Fultz has something, you know, like I like Jackson um, from Kansas. I could see him possibly be in the number two pick. He's very athletic, fits the up-tempo system, but again, but not a great outside shooter. Um, a little smaller, um, a little, um, you know, I, I just don't know. Sometimes it doesn't translate as much from that, that level to this level. Um so, you know, defense-wise and so on. I, I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, um, as I said, after number one, it gets real interesting to me. If it's, it, or two, if, Fultz, if, 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 if ball goes first, you know, um, to me, that's when it gets really, really interesting. And everybody, as I said, has a, something that's not quite right or something that, they, you know, the old uh, was square peg round hole or round hole square peg, yeah. whatever it is, um, with the Sixers. Hey, Tom, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of percentages and a lot of craziness out there, but what are some of the best scenarios for Philadelphia tonight? Because there's a lot of them. They have a lot of things tied in. uh, But what are some of the uh, most likely things that could happen for them tonight? The most likely uh, numbers four and five. uh, The only ones over 10 percent are numbers four and five and just number five. Those are the most likely uh, percentage-wise. One of them's 18%. One of them's 14%. Um, uh, so it, it just it, it there's so many, I mean the difference between one and four, which is the best case scenario, 2.43%, and six and seven, which is 0.8%, which is the worst case scenario. I mean that is a huge difference. So to me, as I said, if you get number one, it's a successful draft to me. I'd almost rather uh, have the not get the pick and get it unprotected for next year when you have a chance theoretically to get the number one pick and you could get Porter or Doncic next year, uh, theoretically, as opposed to getting you know, number five or six, especially number four, you know, not, you know, I would you know one and four, you can't argue with that, but if it's going to be later than that, I would just as soon um, wait. And then you got to remember these are going to be up for contracts at the same time too. So it's nice to sort of spread that out where you add, add a guy this year and then add another top guy next year. So at the same time, you're not having to pay these guys $25, $30 million. You're not going to be able to pay four guys probably that much money. That's going to be the whole cap and exceeding the cap. You have to find out if they're willing to pay the luxury tax. So, yeah, there's so many different things that can happen. Um, and it's you know, if, if you, you know, said you must say what's going to happen, um, I would guess that 
and, and no reason why I, that they're going to get number three. It's happened two years in a row, and then last year they got number one. I just have a funny feeling. But, there, but there's nothing that I would say, you know, uh, this is definitely going to happen, right? I, I really think this is going to happen. That just is – I just have a little bit of a feeling about that, but nothing that I would certainly say is uh, strong or, or, you know, overwhelming. Yeah, Tom, so you say that best-case scenario, one and four, but it's funny because most people would say then if they don't get one and four, well, how about two and four? But maybe uh, you would support the argument then that if you get two, don't say two and four is the best, uh, second-best scenario. The topic alone would be a better scenario than that. Well, yeah, because, I mean, you know, let's say they, they really want faults, and let's say they do get two and four. Would you be willing to trade two and four for Fultz? And if you do that, now you don't get the Lakers pick next year. If you get number one um, and you don't get a second pick, now you still have your own pick next year, which you know prob- probably wouldn't be as high, assuming Embiid's healthy, Simmons is healthy, et cetera. And then you know y- you would have the, the the Lakers pick, and you know that I don't think they're going to be a playoff team next year, so you'd be in the lottery, you know, with them. So, yeah, it's, there's so many different ways to look at it. Some people are getting tired of waiting. You know, this is the, <laughs> this is the, fifth, this is the fifth lottery, you know, of, of the, since the, you know, Hinky, uh, you know, since Sam Hinky took over in 2013. I believe it's my 17th lottery I've covered. This is wow. my, my 30th season. So they've, you know, they, I think there were seven in a row in the 90s, and then this is my fifth in a row in this stretch. So that's 12 um, just in that one stretch anyway. So, yeah, it's uh, – it's kind of amazing, but yeah, this I, I, I thought last year was really important, but I think this year could conceivably be even more important. Uh, and there's some uh, precedents, as you wrote over at the Bucks County Courier Times. Tom Moore is with us. Uh, that uh, if they were to unprecedentedly get a one in four, that hasn't been done all that much, but one team that has done it, they're still playing. Yeah, the Cavaliers. Exactly. I, I looked it up, and in the last 20 years, only four times has a team gotten two picks in the top seven, and the Sixers have a 53.1% chance to do that. So it's very rare. But, yes, in 2011, the uh, the Cavs, uh, you know, took Kyrie Irving at one and Tristan Thompson at four. That's two starters, you know, with LeBron. Obviously, LeBron makes it go. But it's only happened uh, uh, three other times, um, you know, since then. Rubio, I think it was 2009 with the Timberwolves, with Rubio and Johnny Flynn. 2000 with the Bulls, Marcus Pfizer and Chris Mim, I think it was, and then the Celtics in 97 when they got um, Ron Mercer with the seventh pick, and then they got Chauncey Billups at number three. So it, it has been a rare occurrence. So, I mean, it, it, it could be, you know, really something, you know, really something, um, you know, it's really something special for the Sixers. It is, and uh, we know um, they already have some pieces that, uh, you know, the argument on one side is, well, they have pieces. The other side is, well, they're never on the floor. Uh, what's the latest on Joel Embiid and uh, whether or not we should be concerned about him being on the floor more this year? He said he, he did an ESPN interview earlier today, and he said that um, he should be out on the court in, I think he said, two or three weeks. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. I don't think he'll be scrimmaging or whatever, and he's not going to play summer league. So, you know, it's going to take some time and, you know, he's, there's not a big rush now, uh, but I, you know, you'd like him ready uh, mid September, mid late September when they start uh, training camp, but it sounds like, you know, he's making progress. And then Simmons last week posted that Instagram um, of him dunking and, you know, working out a couple of possessions on offense where it looks like he's making progress too. So, um, you know, you never know. I mean, he's played in 31 games out of 246 in beads. So, um but he's the key to the whole thing. I mean, it, uh, it, even if they get faults, he's the cornerstone. He's the guy um, that's going to, you know, probably ultimately determine whether this works or doesn't work in terms of, you know, making deep runs in the playoff. Yeah, I mean, obviously his health is uh, paramount. But uh, Simmons, you know, he's another wild card because that foot injury has such a high level of uh, re-injury, right? I mean, he could play 10 games and then, boom, the same thing happens to him again. So he's another really wild card in this whole thing. So uh, I I guess after this year, you you feel like maybe they're in the clear. But this year is another one of kind of white knuckle, right? Yeah, I mean, I would assume that Embiid's going to be on a minute restriction. I don't know if he's going to play back-to-back games. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. They were so cautious last year, and he still, you know, ended up missing um, the last two and a half months with a different injury, you know, with the knee, which turned into a, uh, a torn ACL and had the surgery March 24th. So, 
Um, yeah, I mean, you just never know. I mean, it's 275 pounds, you know, pound every step he takes, you know, pounding. And even if it's 28 minutes or whatever it is, that's a lot of force on a right, you know, on a right foot that, that uh, had two surgeries and a left knee that's, you know, he's had the, had the surgery, uh, in March. So you just never know. You just hope that's all they can do at this point. (laughs) Uh, you watched last night's game seven, I would assume, um, if you're a Sixers fan and you watch that game, you feel better or worse? Uh, I mean, I know what you mean. They're not like great, great teams, but to me, you know, you know, a guy like Avery Bradley, you know, the, the Sixers don't have anybody like that. They don't have a defense. I mean, I, I like Covington, but I mean, he's a stopper. You know, he's a defensive stopper, and he can shoot the ball. And they they have some experience. Their problem is the Celtics. Well, obviously LeBron coming up. You know, they they could lose in four or five games. But um, the Celtics' problem is Horford's 32, and he's a core guy. You know, I, I, he's probably on the way down already, and he's a key guy, and there's no real great big guys this year coming out where you could draft them and bring them along slowly, and two years could take over when Horford's 34 or whatever. So that's, that's the thing, you know, with them. But, you know, I, those teams are significantly ahead of the Sixers um, uh, in terms of, you know, experience and core group. But uh, – you know, they've been together for a fair amount, too. And that's why if you get a full and you have, you know, your starting group, assuming Embiid and Simmons are healthy, um, and now you start, you know, seeing how it works. Is Sarge a long-term starter at the four? Um, you know, uh, how will Simmons handle playing the point on offense, et cetera? And then you react and you go from there. And then, you know, you see uh, either the trade deadline next year or next summer with, you know, with the draft and free agency and so on. You see, um, you know, if you can take it another step. Um, how about, uh, you know, and, and you look at um, where they are. Um, obviously, tonight's very big in that. But when push comes to shove, this league, you know, you look at the three teams. You got San Antonio, you got Golden State, and you got Cleveland. Uh, they all built themselves – three different ways right i mean that that's really the moral of this story is there is no right way to do it yeah yeah for sure i mean golden state was uh, you know was more through the draft and oklahoma city before that before they couldn't you know keep everybody and uh yes uh, you are correct so there is no one you know specific to say well we got to do it this way Ideally, you like to get a star through the draft so they're young and you have salary control for four years, as opposed to paying Kyle Lowry, you know, 140 million over four years or whatever, um, and then Embiid's eligible for an extension starting in eight, 18, 19. They could, you know, talk about that this summer. Um, you know, you, you have to start figuring out long term who's a keeper, what are they worth, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it's 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 very interesting. Yeah, Cleveland. That does you know, well? They they drafted LeBron. He left and then came back. And you know they they uh, you know the bench is all veterans that they signed from around the league. But that that 2011 draft with Kyrie and Tristan Thompson, you know, was very effective in terms of two key guys. And then they got from getting lucky with Larry with Wiggins and trading him and getting love that way. So they kind of the draft has helped them, but they've been able to do some other things too. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a very frustrating league to try to build in because I asked the question the other day, Tom. If you take out San Antonio, Cleveland, and Golden State, which team in this league uh, do you like the path they're on? Which team would you emulate? And uh, they're hard to find. Yeah, no, there's nothing you know obvious that uh, you know that I would say. I mean, uh, the Rock, you know, the Rockets obviously had a really good you know really good year, but yeah, I mean, they signed Harden. Um. Yeah. I right. I don't know. Is is this going to be a long term thing, or do they have one or two shots? Um. And that you still have to go through San Antonio and Golden State. You know, which in the West, in the East, everybody's pretty much playing for second. You know, I saw a poll last night online, and and when I last saw it, seventy percent of, of assuming mostly fans said they'd rather get the number one pick than win Game Seven. I thought that was interesting oh. because. Oh, they last know, night, last night. Right, going into the game because they know what's ahead and they know the chances right. of making the finals are not good. Whereas if you get the number one pick and they would love, you know, they would love to get Fultz and play him at the two opposite, you know, opposite Isaiah. And don't forget Isaiah is a free agent in 2018 and is going to want a ton of money. And you, do you want to throw a lot of money, you know, $30 million at him? I, you know, I don't know. So it's just interesting how the lottery is, the lottery and the draft are just such huge things 
uh, but whether it's the NFL or you know or the NBA, especially those two leagues, just incredible. Yeah, well, it's funny because uh, the irony of the Boston people is the only reason they like their situation is the same reason everyone kind of mocks the Sixers. You only like Boston because they have ping pong balls. That's it. If you don't, if they don't have ping pong balls, they're just hanging out in the middle with everybody else. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, in the East, they're you know they're a, they're a formidable team. They're certainly a second round team and potentially a conference final team. But unless there's a significant injury to Cleveland, they're not making the finals. Everybody else is playing for second in the East, um, and everybody pretty much knows that. So yes, you you are correct, Mike. All right, Tom Moore is uh, at the NBA draft lottery tonight, and uh, it's a. I'm here now. I'm actually ready to go get some dinner. All right. Well, we don't want to keep you from that, of course. Uh, that's always a big time <laughs> up there, uh, and of course, uh, the Sixers uh, NBA draft lottery. It's at halftime tonight. Is that still at halftime? Is that what they do? They do it at halftime. No, it's, still? Be- it's, it's before, before the game. Right? It's a late game, so yeah. it's it's. I think it's eight thirty to nine. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay, and you can hear that right here on ninety-seven three ESPN. Tom, bring us luck, man. Uh, I'll be here. I don't know. About uh, well, you, you've been a part of what? 17, you said? You've seen the number one pick twice. So uh, third, third time's a charm. All right. Whatever. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take care, man. Bye-bye.